Our focus text today comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 1 to 18. I invite you to follow along on your screens. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting there where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? And supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned to him and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. It is Easter, and as is our tradition, we gather to worship, to encounter the presence of God, to reflect how the central event of our faith story shapes our own personal stories, how we see life, how we encounter the world, ourselves, others. <laughs> Let me be really honest with you, though, today. For many people in my position who speak about this story and why it matters, Easter is kind of a hard day. I mean, what do you say that has not already been said a hundred times before about a story that most Christians consider to be familiar? I would even say routine. I mean, would you even believe me if I told you that the story we encounter today has an edge to it, that it challenges how we make sense of the world, that it's even controversial? Would you buy that? Is that the story that you know and celebrate? I mean, I, I don't think it is because for one, I think most of us hear the Easter story as a matter of fact kind of story. The authors tell us that this is what happened and we're like, oh, well, that's good to know. But I mean, what if there's more to it than that? So. As a way of getting to the depth of the Easter story, I want to do something that I did several years ago at a Christmas worship that I think could be kind of fun for us today. So today is a big family day, and I'm not sure to our online community who's watching us today, uh, if you are worshiping with your kids or your extended relatives, but if you are, well, you know that oftentimes during a family gathering, games are just essential. Competition is essential. So today I give you Chad's Easter Church Nerd Trivia Smackdown. Yeah, 
Now, families, if you are worshiping together today, you can play together as a unit, or you can compete against one another in your family. It's totally your choice. And yes, I do know there are a fair number of you who are, are worshiping today by yourself. And the good news is that this trivia game can also be a one player game. Or, well, if there's anybody in your house, you could just invite them to participate with you right now. That's fine too. So it's quite simple. I'll pose some Easter questions and I would like you to answer them in your families together. Um, you can do this again in competition with one another or just by yourself. Just so you know, this is not meant to be quiet. If you are playing with somebody else, I fully expect you to talk to one another. So after I ask each question, you're going to get a 30 second timer on the screen to contemplate your answer. And once you, the 30 seconds is up, uh, we move on to the next question after hearing the answer to that one. Does that make sense? I hope so, let's, let's give it a try. Here we go. Question number one. Who was the first person or people to come to Jesus' tomb on Easter? Was it A, Jesus' mother or family? Was it B, Jesus' disciples? Was it C, some women? Or was it D, the gardener? 30 seconds on the clock, ready, set, go. All right, I hope you got your answer. The answer is C, some women. Within all of the Gospels, it is a woman or a group of women who are first on the scene. And I think that's really important to remember. Question number two, according to Matthew's Gospel, why were the women going to Jesus' tomb? Was it A, to confront the Roman soldiers guarding the body? B, to see the tomb, C, to take Jesus' body, or D, to anoint Jesus' body with good smelling spices. Ready? Here is 30 seconds. All right, if you said D, you would be right if you were reading the Gospel of Mark or the Gospel of Luke. In John's Gospel, there is no reason given because Jesus' body has already been spiced, but in Matthew's Gospel, which the question asked, the women come to see the tomb. That's what it's about. All right, here's question number three. In Luke's Gospel, was the tomb already open when the group of women arrived? A. Yes, Jesus' tomb was open. Or B. No, Jesus' tomb was not open, but the stone was rolled away by an angel when the women arrived. 30 seconds, here you go. And the answer is A, yes, the tomb was already open in Luke's Gospel. Answer B is what happens in Matthew's Easter story. All right, here we go. The last question. Who was at the tomb when the women arrived? Was it A, one angel, B, two angels, C, one young man, D, two young men, E, Chad, this is getting annoying. Stop messing with us. This is probably a trick question. So none of the above. 
There's your options. Ready, 30 seconds and go. And the answer to the question is A, B, C, and D. So if you answered anything but E, you are correct even though I am messing with you. And, or, but the answer is, is not none of the above. I mean, these are all correct answers, A, B, C, and D, because I did not specify the gospel. So depending if you were reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John's Easter story, you will encounter one of these characters or set of characters. All right, so now tally up your correct answers and see who wins Easter in your family. I want you to see that while the Easter story occurs in all four Gospels, and while it is a central part of our faith tradition, the stories are not the same. The resurrection stories are told differently because each of these writers wants to tell you why it matters and what it means for how to live out our days in the world. I mean, these stories are not concerned about the individual details. So, what does the resurrection mean? In the Gospel of John, after Jesus died, his disciples went into hiding because they were scared. Jesus was crucified, which means that he was executed as an enemy of the state. Crucifixion was not just a simple method of execution. It was about sending a very public message, which was this. Do what this person did and you will meet the same fate. Crucifixion, it's a warning. Rome used this method of execution as a deterrent to undesirable behavior. <laughs> so what did Jesus do? Well, Jesus proclaimed that the kingdom of God was coming near, or the way that the world would be if God was in charge and those in charge now were not, was coming to pass. And Jesus shows us what that looks like by what he says and by what he does. And so when Jesus feeds crowds of people who are hungry and who are poor, the kingdom of God is about having enough for all. It's about justice. It's about seeing the least and the most vulnerable among us. When Jesus heals people, he shows us that the kingdom of God is about removing that which prevents the life God dreams for God's good creation. It's about restoration of relationships. It's about being made whole. Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount, in the Beatitudes, that the kingdom of God is, is self-sacrificial love. It's grace. It's compassion. It's forgiveness. It's about being vulnerable and listening to others. It's about learning and, and humility. <laughs> but you can't say things like that and expect life to go well for you. The kingdom of God is threatening to those people and those systems that seek to maintain power by controlling people through violence and fear and war and intimidation. And Jesus challenges those ways. He challenges the way that we have structured our world and he's crucified for it. I mean, if you were witness to this, how would you not be overwhelmed with despair? Is this not the way that our world works? Is, is the world not ultimately a cold, hard, dead place? Is darkness the reality that we live in? And so any light that we see, any glimmers of hope that we do stumble across, or those that are just short in their, their existence? Are, are they just blips in what otherwise is a cold, uncaring, meaningless existence? I mean, if, if this is true, 
then despair is the only reasonable response. I mean, it is so easy to be cynical in, in this world. The resurrection gives us hope. It tells us that there is more to the story, that God has not given up on the world. The Easter story is God's affirming the kingdom of God that Jesus proclaimed and enacted, even though the powers of this world worked to silence it. Resurrection is about God's redeeming, restoring, and renewing the world that we are living in. In this world, greed, violence, and abuse, they don't belong to the kingdom of God. Here's, here's the thing about despair, though. You can get stuck in despair. You can fixate on it. You can dwell in it until it consumes you. But you can also downplay despair by pretending that everything is great all the time and by looking at the world through rose-colored glasses. The story of the resurrection does not do either of those things. It acknowledges how brutal life can be and the suffering people go through, as well as acknowledging that there is hope. Resurrection takes suffering and enables us to move forward to find hope. When you ask yourself, are things going to be okay? <laughs> Will I make it through this school year? I am so tired of getting picked on. I am weary. I don't fit in. Will I be okay after my divorce? I feel so much shame right now. Will I survive the death of my parents because honestly, I'm scared. They are declining quickly. I don't know what to expect. I think it's going to be really hard, even just plain awful. I have early stage Alzheimer's. I'm going to forget those that I love. I'm going to forget their names. I'm going to forget their faces. Oh my God, is it even possible to have hope? The story of resurrection means that there is more to the story than we think. That there is a bigger, better ending than we can currently imagine. That in the midst of great stress, anxiety, and despair, there is hope that can drive us forward one day at a time, one step at a time. When resurrection becomes just an intellectual argument, it loses this power. Resurrection changes the way that we see ourselves, others, and the world. It changes the way how we live and structure, to how we live and how we create our structures in this world. The resurrection tells us that there is hope, which is not limited to any one particular person or group. This is the story of Easter. This is the good news that we hear today. Thanks be to God for that. Amen.